Ne needs to be informed. It's okay, Rebecca, we're human. Needs to be informed by that history in order to best serve our communities and realize our commitment to be inclusive organizations. This statement, although it's a small gesture towards reconciliation, is a call for us and the, the organizations we are a part of to move beyond words and into meaningful action. So um, at any point, if your group wants to use this land acknowledgement to start your meetings or conversations, you're welcome to do so. There's nothing copyrighted or privileged about it. Um, it is a way to, again, center us and to help remind us that um, the past is present and it's shaping the way in which we engage with one another and is really important place to start um, to, to ground us. So today in our learning journey, uh, in, in some form or fashion, it may not be structured in this way, but in some form or fashion, we're gonna talk about the history of legalized disenfranchisement. I don't believe I'm gonna be sharing anything new with folks, but it's good to go over it. We're gonna talk about the definition of equity and we're gonna weave that into why it matters for us. We'll talk a little bit about unconscious patterns that are part of our, um, our past, when we think about our history and how that has led to structural barriers. And then throughout our time together, you will pick up some tools that will help you to identify where barriers might exist or where opportunities are available to ensure full participation. participation. Rebecca talked about um, asking questions. I'll do my best to respond to questions. It may be easier to kind of get further along and then pause and ask questions because sometimes I found that the question is related to something I'm just about to say. So we'll do the best that we can with that. But Rebecca will also forward questions to me at a later time so that I could um, provide answers. It may be something that um, she can share one-on-one -on -one or is addressed in the next session. So before we get started, I saw this somewhere and I thought this was a good image to get us thinking about where we are right now in our bodies, in our mind, in our energy, so that we can prepare ourselves um, for learning. So before we dig in, I would like you, I would like us to pause and make note of how we're feeling right now. What is our energy level and to be aware of any distractions that are around us. All of this serves to impact um, our learning and impact our perception of what we're learning and impact um, how what we learn is, is embedded. So I know it's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning and for most people, maybe this, this is when your energy is at the highest, but it, it may not be for you. So I want you to think about right now, what's your energy level today? Did you get enough sleep? Um, did you get your coffee? I got half a cup of coffee. So let's see how far that takes me. Um, what's happening around you? Are there any distractions? Is it noisy? Is it too cold, too hot, too dark, too bright? And at the same time, I'd like you to think about what's your internal state like? Are you feeling anxious, excited, amused, upset, curious, uncertain, or motivated? How will any of that impact your learning today? I'd like you to consciously think about it. And then think about what is the one thing you can do to shift your energy and attention? So for us today, and for some folks, it may be that it's easier to um, you know, dim the light, to have a cup of water, to be in a comfortable place. Um, to have a way to take notes or to not take notes. This is going to be recorded. It may be better for you to pay attention without taking notes to be able to stay curious. But either way, I um, encourage you to be conscious of that so that you can engage in the learning. So another thing I want to share, and I um, offer this also as a tool. So the energy, the energy, um, that I was talking about before this slide prior to this. This is a, a tool also that you would use in your meetings to center everyone. Where are we at? Because our energy and the level of distraction is gonna impact the decisions that we make and also 
how we perceive and hear other people. Um, so I offer community building practices. Uh, the first one here is the Four Agreements for Courageous Conversations as another tool to help center conversations and bring us all into the room. So you can take that um, for your groups. And the four agreements are, were developed by Glenn Singleton um, as a tool in um, um, education in the school systems as they talked about some tough um, conversations. But I share this here because it has value for, for this conversation as well. So the four agreements are very simple to stay engaged. And that means across all spheres of our engagement and our influence, that's morally, emotionally, intellectually, you know, we set the stage for that, um, but it's something to consciously think about. It's to speak your truth. Use I statements when you're talking, right? So it's not a, the, these conversations are not ways to turn the mirror out. It's an opportunity to turn the mirror in, to share your unique experience, uh, experience discomfort and be okay with the experience of discomfort. This norm acknowledges that discomfort is inevitable. When we talk about new things, different things, and um, oftentimes we uh, have to sit differently at the table, that might be uncomfortable for us. While the, um, the community building practice here, the four agreements mentions race, which is important. I'm talking about all conversations that encompass equity, um, and that might be tough for us or our groups to engage in. And then finally, to expect and accept non-closure. This agreement asks us to hang out in uncertainty. Um, and we are not here to rush to quick solutions. And that's really important because I think oftentimes our norm in the work world, on teams and organizations, when we're working together to find a solution, is to be solution-minded and to cut off opportunities for dialogue. So that's a tool that you can use um, uh, and it's important to reflect on. So while I won't go into the deeper aspects of the art of conversation, I will share, I believe I may have it in the four agreements and community building document that's on the website. Um, so you can see it there. But I just wanted to share really quickly this quote from Margaret Wheatley. And what she shares here is that human conversation is the most ancient and easiest way to cultivate the conditions for change. And I think that's really important when we talk about personal change, community and organizational change, and Margaret talks about planetary change, is that conversation is at the core and at the heart of um, finding solutions and cultivating um, the conditions, the factors that implement, that it will affect change, excuse me. Um, in conversation, we share what we see, what we feel, and we listen to what others see and feel. And that's an important place to start um, and to move forward in this conversation. So for us in this process of learning and reflection, at least the tools that I'm using today is that we are going to widen our lens. Um, we're gonna look at things from a bigger perspective um, and that's an important place to start. We're gonna look back to look forward. I talked about the past being present. Again, that's an important place to kind of ground our learning. And then we're gonna reflect out and, and then in. And the reason why I would say reflect out and then in is that it's easy to take the position of um, what's in it for me and how am I impacted but a, a more um, productive and effective place to start when we talk about change um, or even about being curious as we look out and then we look in. So we look at our impact and then reflect back on, huh, what was my intention? And was this really something that I was hoping to um, experience? Was this the outcome I was looking for? So there's various ways that we can apply that, but I wanted us to, to center um, center our thinking in that regards. So I've been talking a lot about looking back to so look forward and um, the past is always present. I want to talk a little bit about the history um, of legalized disenfranchisement in this country. I don't think I'm going to be sharing history that's new with folks, but it's good to kind of refresh ourselves. And why do we start with history? We look at history in a way, um, I would say like a, a rear view mirror. 
It helps us to understand our perceptions in the moment and those that influenced our behaviors, the subsequent decisions, and then the outcomes of those decisions. So we look back as an opportunity to ask, what do we know about our intent? Um, uh, because it's easy to look back and explore intention um, as opposed to starting with intention and trying to defend that place. And then what was the impact of that intention? And essentially what we're asking ourselves is how did we get here? And what has history taught us? So we'll, we'll uh, talk about that more in a little bit. So I'm gonna share some facts of history. Most of this we know. I have links on here you can go to later um, and explore it more yourself. Of course, you know, the internet is full of information where you can pull up um, the original documents and, um, and see some of this. So on the next few slides, I'll share some. So in 1854, People versus Hall, this is a California Supreme case, Supreme Court case that ruled that the testimony of a uh, Chinese man who witnessed a murder by a white man was inadmissible, denying Chinese alongside Native and African Americans the status to testify in courts against whites. And so we see here the impact on our human right to be able to um, participate in the um, court legal political system. And we see the impact of that there. In 1875, this US Supreme Court case declared that despite the privileges and immunities clause, a state can prohibit a woman from voting. The court declares women as persons, but holds that they constitute a special category of non-voting citizens. And again, we see early on um, the impact to those of us who identify as women on our ability to vote and participate um, in the um, electorate process. In 1882, uh, many of us are familiar with the Chinese Exclusion Act. Essentially, this excluded Chinese laborers from entering the country for 10 years under penalty of imprisonment. Um, and that um, too is a reflection on our, on our um, immigration history. Um, I don't, I don't know that I need to share too much about slavery and segregation and Jim Crow, um, but what I do want to share here to further our conversation about legalized disenfranchisement is the Black Codes, which were also called um, the Black Laws, were enacted in 1865 in order to control the behavior of newly freed Blacks. These codes were state laws used to restrict and criminalize Black people. Um, some examples of this might be um, any person who was able to work is not allowed to wander or stroll about leisurely. Such people will be deemed vagrants and be arrested. Anyone can arrest a vagrant. Anyone can arrest a vagrant. Landowners or other people with a source of income are not subject to any vagrancy laws. Another one would be no person of color can be an artisan, mechanic, or shopkeeper or pursue any other trade or business besides farming, manual labor, or domestic service. Other codes, no person of color can testify against a white person in court. We saw that in an earlier example, unless the person agrees to it. It is a felony crime for any person of color to marry a white person. White people may not marry freedmen or other people of color. Any person who commits this crime will be sentenced to life in prison. And so we see this encroachment on our human rights, on our liberties. Um, and we see this encroaching on our ability to fully participate, engage in all the dimensions of being uh, uh, a citizen, a resident of this country. Only white men can serve on juries, hold office and vote in any state, county or municipal election. And finally, no colored person has the right to vote, hold office, or sit on juries in this particular state. That was Tennessee. So again, history gives us the tools to analyze and explain our past um, problems. It also helps us to see patterns that might otherwise be invisible uh, in the present. So I wanted to share that. Um, so we can 
share two more here. Um, so we are aware that the 14th Amendment in 1868 defined citizens and voters as male and women were not granted the right to vote until legislation was passed in 1866 and then ratified two years later in 1868. It wasn't until the 19th Amendment that most of us are aware of that women gained the right to vote in 1920. And then finally, the last few, well, it's actually two more slides here. Finally, um, the last two here, uh, in between the 1890s and 1960s, literacy, literacy tests were used to disenfranchise Blacks. So the tests were used to determine um, whether or not a Black person could vote. Um, and so that's another example in 1907, we see the eugenic sterilization law for people with disabilities was enacted. And essentially this um, act uh, became the, the, Indiana was the first state to enact this sterilization law. Um, and it was then, how do I say, it was then um, used in other uh, states, I guess once it, they found it successful, they repeated it in other states. Um, and then in 1917, the Immigration Act restricted immigration by individuals who exhibit constitutional psychopathic inferiority. That's a lot of words. Um, and it was a legislative classification that was eventually used to discriminate based on sexual orientation. So we see how different identity groups were impacted. And on this last slide here, um, I wanted to mention Japanese internment, particularly because of how close to home um, that law impacted us. And so this poster here, you can see instructions to all Japanese living on Bainbridge Island. So the Japanese internment was a forced relocation and internment of the, by the United States in 1942 of approximately 110,000 Japanese Americans and Japanese residing along the Pacific coast of the United States uh, to camps that were called war relocation camps. So Japanese Americans residing on the west coast of this country were all interned. Um, uh, and then, uh, whereas in Hawaii, where there were more than 150,000 Japanese Americans that composed nearly a third of that territory's pop population, um, a good portion up to 1800 of the Americans were interned. Of those interned, 62% were American citizens. And so that strikes me as important as well to think about who we were back then. Um, and maybe we see that in present day where even as American citizens, laws are enacted that um, inhibit our ability to engage fully in the legal system. Uh, so before we move forward and we talk about connecting the past to the present, I want us to think about the inequities um, that might be a result of institutionalized policies at the local, state, and federal levels. We've are already heard some of those um, on the surface when I talked about legislation that were passed. Uh, but those inequities then result in disparities, not only in housing, but in healthcare, employment, education, in voting, as I mentioned, um, and other dimensions of our human rights. And so as part of our reflection now and in the future, I'd ask you to think about what are some present day examples of inequities that are a result of discriminatory laws? It's a good, a good place to um, reflect. So I've talked about legislation um, again, as I said, we talk about the past because it helps us to reflect on how those decisions are shaping our present and what our role might be in um, changing, finding solutions to shape our future differently. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about the systems that we've, we're all born into and that we've acquired. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how that's formed um, and then move into why uh, equity matters. So what I'm sharing here is um, a diagram called the cycle of socialization. You will see different 
uh, versions of this cycle, but essentially the, it's the same cycle of socialization developed by Bobby Hero. Um, the cycle of socialization teaches us how we are first socialized um, or taught to understand roles, norms, values, and rules. And so I'll walk us through this a little bit to help us think about um, how we might be socialized. So what happens first in um, the beginning before we are born, so that's, you know, this, this area here, before we are born, that's the first step in the socialization process, and it's outside of our control. Our socialization begins before we are born with no choice on our part, um, and no one brings us into this discussion while we are in the room, in the womb. Um, we are, um, are born into identities that are ascribed to us at birth, through no effort or decision or choice of our own. And on top of these givens, we are born into a world where a lot of the mechanics, assumptions, rules, roles, and structures of oppression are already in place and are functioning. We've had nothing to do with constructing them. So I often tell people, we are born into these systems. We have no fault in the way that they are constructed, but we do have an opportunity to be part of change. Um, so in the beginning, we have no information or limited information or maybe misinformation. Um, the characteristics of the system we are born into are built long before we existed, of course, based on history, as I've already shared, on habit, on tradition, on patterns of belief. You've heard me say patterns several times, prejudices, stereotypes, and myths. So all of these are working in advance. And so our first socialization then um, is taught to us on a personal level. So maybe our parents, our teachers, those to which we are close um, and those to which we, we love and trust the most, um, they help to shape our self-concepts, our self-perceptions, the norms and the rules that we are told we must follow, the roles we are taught we have to play, our expectations for the future and our dreams. This socialization is happening both intrapersonally, so how we think about ourselves and interpersonally, how we relate to others. Um, and these messages are, are automatic, right? They're part of our early socialization. We don't initially question them and they become part of uh, uh, what we say is our identity. Um, and regardless of what is taught to us, we are then exposed without any initial question, as I said, to a strong set of rules, roles, and assumptions um, that cannot help but shape our sense of ourselves in the world. They influence what we take with us out into the world. So then we move into, from there, institutional and cultural socialization. I have to remember to read my notes because it's a lot here. Um, in institutional and cultural socialization, that's when messages are reinforced and we are often bombarded uh, with additional messages. And these happen on conscious and unconscious levels. So I have to remind myself to say this, that whether we choose to be socialized or not, it is happening on an unconscious level and at a, a level that we are not only unaware of, but oftentimes can't control. So this might happen in our institutions, like our, our churches, our school. It might happen through media and television, through the legal system. I've already pointed that out, through um, um, our, the way in which mental health is uh, treated or responded to, medicine, business, our culture, our practices, um, our song lyrics, um, uh, patterns of thought, that's where messages are reinforced um, and be become part of not only our institutional, as you see here, but our cultural socialization. And then enforcements happen along the way. And enforcements look different. Um, they may look like um, sanctioning. Again, these are, uh, if we think about our history that I've mentioned, it's uh, legislation. Um, so that's our sanctioning, um, either how um, individuals, identities, groups are stigmatized, um, uh, the rewards and punishments that we might experience, the 
privilege that we may have either um, consciously or unconsciously, um, willingly or unwillingly, the persecution we experience, and then even further into discrimination or empowerment. Um, and we largely, we don't ignore the messages that we hear, um, the structures and assumptions that we are a part of because they are enforcements that have been in place to maintain the socialization that has basically been established before us. And so for the most part, we don't ignore them. Um, we may try to contradict them in a way, but if we do that, we pay a price for our, our let's say for our independent thinking. And for people who conform, as I mentioned, either consciously or unconsciously, and maybe minimally receive some type of benefit, um, uh, they might be considered like a normal or a team player and they're allowed to stay in their place. So that's how reinforcements um, work. But what's the results of that? So I'll share a little bit of the notes here that I have for the results. The results of that is that we might experience um, dissonance. Um, we might uh, experience anger, a sense of being silenced. Again, it depends on the identity that you hold and how you uh, experience this socialization and reinforcements. Um, we might experience low self-esteem, high levels of stress, a sense of hopelessness and disempowerment that can then lead to things like crime and self-destructive behavior, frustration, mistrust, and more importantly, dehumanization. So whether we participate by enforcing the stereotype or we continue to collude in this treatment, um, we, we per perpetuate this system of oppression and this cycle of socialization. But there's a decision point here where we can take action. And the action might look like doing nothing, don't make waves, you know, promote the status quo, or it could look like change. It could look like raising consciousness interrupting this pattern of socialization, educating ourselves, educating others, questioning what we're experiencing and reframing the systems and the experience that we are a part of. I know that that was a lot, um, but it's really important to talk uh, about socialization in a way for us to understand that um, while we might hold um, um, one identity that is visible there are identities that are invisible, that are, there are identities that are assigned to us. Um, there are identities that we are um, an unwillingly born into and a part of. And all of that is because we are socialized um, along the way. And so um, I like to talk about socialization because it helps us to think about what's happening, not only on a conscious, but an unconscious level. And that helps us to think about more um, about our uh, not only privilege, but marginalization um, and how that shapes our experiences. So I just talked about identity. I talked a little bit about what is conscious and unconscious to us, those ascribed to us and those that we self-declare, um, those that are visible and invisible and I think this is a good time to then move into the social identity will. So the social identity will is a way for us to look at some dimensions of diversity. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that further in, a, in the next few sections. Um, but this, the cycle of socialization is a way for us to think about how identities are formed and um, kind of um, surfaced in our day-to-day -day life. So um, when I talk about socialization, I want us to think about what does that mean in the way of social group identities? So what it means is that ideas about our social group identities are internalized early on in our life. Whether we are conscious of it or not, as I mentioned, we are all socialized to believe and act in some way. So I'm gonna go back up here um, to show us that this is when it's happening, right? Early on, but more, more so when it's reinforced and enforced through institutional and cultural socialization. Um, we are all socialized in some ways to recognize and act on messages about 
our social group identity and about other group, social group identities, whether we talk about it explicitly or not. So we don't have to talk about race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status. We don't have to talk about any of these identities because it's reinforced um, in the messages around us and in the way we're told to engage with one another. And then finally, what it means is that our identities can impact our experience. And so whether or not I am part of the social group or I'm a part of a different social group, that identity that I hold shapes the experience that I have. So understanding how we are socialized to think about our social group identity and other social group identities helps us to recognize and disrupt patterns of behaving. And one of which I'm going to talk about is um, disrupting bias. So we'll talk about that next. Right. So um, we I, I don't know that I mentioned this, but we'll talk a little bit about, I'll share some definitions throughout our time together. I believe there is a tool on, I'm gonna click on it really quick on the DEI page that has um, key terms, but also disability terminology, because I think that's important to bring up. Again, it's an identity um, and we should be conscious of that. And so bias um, is formed through early, repeated, reinforced, and rewarded or enforced messages. I've already mentioned that through the cycle of socialization. There's a period in time in which we learn these kind of unconscious ways of thinking about folks, um, and it's embedded in our way of being in the patterns of which we um, engage with others. And so what does that look like? If you have never seen an, uh, an iceberg diagram, this iceberg diagram essentially calls out that while there is a portion of the iceberg that we can see and that we experience, there are deeper, bigger aspects of the iceberg that we don't experience. And so with, for this diagram, bias is a really important aspect of the way in which we might view other people, or more importantly, the experience other people have um, of other social group identities. Uh, and as such, that might look like abuse, discrimination, inequality, ageism, racism, bullying and harassment. So before I dive into bias, I think it's really, uh, it would really be helpful for all of us to think about bias at a, I'm gonna say a higher level. So if you've never heard of the word heuristics, I'm using heuristics now, um, they are mental shortcuts that allow us to solve problems and make judgments quickly and efficiently. Um, so I like to think about it like file folders in our brain, and they hold files that help us to move about and engage in the world quickly. It's meant to help us to, to survive. So a good example is a stove is hot. I don't have to think about a stove being hot. I may have experienced it once, and I know fire is hot. I don't, I don't touch um, fire. So that's a simplified way um, of thinking about what a heuristic um, is. These rule of thumb strategies then shorten our decision-making time and they allow us to function without constantly stopping to think about our next course of action. So you may be thinking about other heuristics that are in uh, your file folder, so to speak, that help you to move about the world um, quickly. Um, however, while there are benefits, there are also uh, uh, drawbacks of heuristics. And so while they're helpful, they can also lead to cognitive biases. So what we learned from the cycle of socialization is that our unconscious biases are formed early um, and they're repeated and reinforced. We learned that, um, that they are automatic ideas about people or things that everyone forms outside of their own conscious awareness. If we remember about the cycle, they're reinforced in messages, um, through kind of keeping the status quo, and then they're repeated through all the rules and the norms and the patterns of engaging that we pass on um, to those around us. Um, also, we learned that unconscious biases can affect our decision-making, right? Because we're going with the status quo, we're following along with messages that are taught to us, it's happening unconsciously, 
And so we're not stopping to check um, the accuracy of the data that we're using. They can affect our behavior. We see that above the diagram um, and they can affect our judgment. Biases can also act to narrow our perceptions of difference. Um, they can be automatic and intentional, but yet affect our judgment and our decisions and behaviors in the way in which we respond to difference. Um, so I wanted to bring, bring that up. And we'll talk a little bit more about here about, so when I talk about perceptions of difference, what I'm talking about are the social group identities that we hold and, and that are uh, that others hold that might be different from ours. So um, a good way to think about it real succinctly is that implicit bias or unconscious bias. So if I haven't made that clear, the unconscious piece is beneath what we see. Our negative associations that are held unknowingly to favor one group over another and can lead to the behavior we visibly see above the iceberg. So what I want us to remember is above the iceberg are the things we see and experience with our five senses and below the iceberg are things that are invisible to us. Um, and that may be subjective, you know, unique to that identity. So we're talking about bias. I'm gonna talk just a little bit about some of these bias. I'm just gonna give definitions only as a way to think about um, very uh, specifically how our biases may target um, different forms of our identity. Oops, I went too far. All right. So um, types of unconscious biases, I, I don't have to read them all I, I, if, if you um, can read them, they're on the screen. I'll also share this with Rebecca. So affinity bias is a preference we may have for someone who is similar to us in attributes or perspectives. Um, that was probably the perfect one to start with because it reinforces this idea that we um, are looking at above the iceberg oftentimes and based on what we see and experience, uh, in the objective, in our five senses, we may have an affinity to that person or groups of people. Perception bias is when our perception is distorted based on assumptions I have about a group or about um, uh, a group that a person belongs to. If we think about the cycle of socialization again, perception is something that is oftentimes taught to us and reinforced in messages and in the ways that we are treated, right? So when I'm rewarded for my perception, that reinforces something, a positive feeling in me. When I'm punished for a perception, it reinforces a negative feeling in me. The halo effect is an overall impression of a positive attribute that influences how we feel or think about others. Again, if we think about above the iceberg and the things that we experience in our senses, that oftentimes we might experience something positive about somebody and attribute great things to them, but we forget, unfortunately, that we're all human and every one of us has something positive about us and every one of us has something that we're working on. Um, so being mindful of the halo effect. Gender bias, I think, is self-explanatory. It's this tendency to prefer one gender over another. We saw that very obviously when I talked about voting rights for women, that was really clear. Confirmation bias is when we interpret evidence or information that confirms a pre-existing belief. We'll see this played out in the next um, uh, example that I'll be sharing with you um, in the way that we frame messages. And then beauty bias again, is um, I would say self-evident and it's this idea that um, our perceptions of goodness and attractiveness contribute to our um, view of a person or groups of people. So I talked about um, the bias we talked about was confirmation bias and that is when we interpret evidence or information that confirms a pre-existing belief. Um, and so I wanted to kind of narrow it in a little bit more and talk about the framing effect. The reason why I want to talk about the framing effect is because um, this is specifically about messaging. 
how we message and how we interpret messaging and therefore how we might change the way in which reinforcements message, the reinforcing messages in, in the cycle of socialization, we can change the way in which those are delivered, right? So we have the power in our tongue and the way we communicate um, to change and to shape messaging um, that uh, is part of that um, in the cycle of socialization, there was a decision point. Um, it can be part of that decision point where we are uh, reframing. And I talked about reframing earlier. So what is the framing effect? And I'll read this definition from simple, Simply Psychology. The framing effect in psychology refers to the bias where people react differently to a particular decision, depending on how it's presented or framed emphasizing either the positive or negative aspects. The same information when framed differently can alter people's responses. So place that in the diagram of socialization to help you think about where we can disrupt or interrupt that cycle uh, in a way that um, helps us to consciously think about how we're responding to difference. So another way to think about the framing effect is that it distorts data and affects perceptions of that data. So the way in which information is presented, I think this is pretty clear now, can affect the decision made by taking advantage um, of a cognitive bias. And I shared that bias earlier. Um, so individually, how does the framing um, effect impact us? Well, it impacts the decisions that we made because we're focused on the way information is presented instead of the information itself, right? So we're not looking at the data, we're looking at the way the data is presented. Um, it also impacts us when we think about our decisions can be suboptimal, they can be poor decisions because we are making them on poor information. Um, and we may have a lower expectation, so to speak, of that information um, because of the way in which it's framed and presented. But we do this because we are uncertain. Um, we're looking for information to fill in the blanks or to confirm what we already know. And that was, again, confirmation bias. We have an idea of what to expect. We hear information and it confirms what we what we think we know, what we already know. So I wanna share an example of a framing effect. So um, I try to do some research online to find some images and they're hard to find. I think we can see this in our day to day, but on the left, on my left here, um, I have an image of um, Fox News versus Fox um, News Latino. This is not about the the new source, this is about the way in which it's presented. So um, in the first diagram, you'll see Fox News Latino. Basically the caption here is um, referencing um, a university grants um, as scholarship for undocumented students, right? But it's the same image in the same story, but the caption says money for illegals. So we can, we can from here imagine how that framing impacts the way the message is received by those who hear it. Um, and the one on the right, I thought it was, was kind of funny, but it's a good example of framing. Again, we see Britney Spears on one side. It looks as if she willingly and consciously um, made a decision to shave her hair, you know, and, uh, but, uh, excuse me, unconsciously and unwillingly made a decision to shave her hair. It was a, she regrets it, it was a bad decision. But on the right, Brittany is smiling and the way in which it's presented, it's something that she wanted to do, right? It's, it's a good thing. So the way in which it's framed um, is the way in which we receive it. And so that's something to think about when we think about the framing effect is to think deeply about how bias occurs in that way and how we rely too much on the way information is presented and therefore um, it further reinforces ideas we have about social groups and different social group identities. So we talked about dimensions. I wanted to share this corn fairy diversity dimension because it's an expanded 
view of the different categories that others might hold or we might hold. And it's a good place for us to stop and think about what have we talked about thus far that's kind of connecting the dots for us um, before we get into a conversation about equity. So what we talked about so far was the way in which we're socialized early on and the way in which we reinforce those messages in the world around us. We talked about social identity that's formed in part through socialization and then reinforced in messages around us. We talked about bias and how in many ways that is at the heart of how we are socialized and therefore how we engage and respond to one another and even more so this impact on the framing effect, how we frame present and deliver messages about our social group and other social groups um, have a huge impact on the way that we um, not only engage, but the way that we do our work, the way that we participate on our committees, the way that we um, make our decisions, choose to form those decisions and the plans that we make. So a good place, a good, a good uh, place for reflection here is to ask ourselves, how might these factors, everything that I've shared so far, work together to create access for some and erect barriers for others? And so we can think about that more in this next exercise. So we'll do this exercise for a few minutes and then Rebecca, I think we might um, be able to take a break there. So in I believe this is on the DEI page. Yep, it's the identities worksheet. You can look there. Um, you don't have to do all of it now. I'm just guiding you through how to do this um, exercise. Um, I want you to think about the identity, identity you claim or that that's ascribed to you. And there are uh, multiple social identities. We saw that in this um, diagram here. We can hold multiple identities. Um, so identify which identity that um, you claim or ascribe to you and moving across these identities, um, excuse me, across these columns, you can choose a check or a mark or scribble, it doesn't really matter um, your responses to each of these questions. And so I'll show you an example of mine. So here's mine. Um, I, I picked some identity groups real quickly. I'm sure I can expand on this. Um, and so a good a place to start is um, I identify as being Black race, my group membership that I've ascribed, uh, that I claim, but I'm pretty sure is ascribed to me is that I'm Black. I am most aware of it. Um, I believe this identity affects how others think of me. It also affects how I perceive myself. Um, and interestingly enough, I did not check that it creates access for me. Um, I can jump down to my first language is English. I am most aware of it. I'm most aware of it because I have parents who were immigrants um, and English was not their first language. And so I saw their experience above the iceberg. I saw their experience in the world as um, non-English speakers, or at least as bilingual, trilingual individuals. My, my parents spoke multiple languages. Um, and so I'm very aware all the time that I speak English. I engage in the world in English. I'm speaking to you in English. I write in English. Like I'm very aware of that. And I'm also aware that it creates access for me. So um, you can expand on that a little bit. You know, I'll give you a few minutes to think about that. And then Rebecca, if maybe at the top of the hour, well, it's only a minute from now, but at the top of the hour, um, we can take that break. So my hope is that as you go through um, exploring identities, that you are also um, reflecting on not only how those identities create um, access for you, um, but 
also where you might experience barriers. So if you pull up the form at a later time from the website, there's some questions for deeper reflection um, and an opportunity for you to think more. But I would also encourage you in your groups, on your committees, um, that you use this tool as a way to reflect more on how your identity um, shows up in the spaces that you're a part of and might impact uh, your engagement. Um, I also suggest that if you use this tool in your groups that you are mindful that some people are not comfortable sharing all of their identities and that's okay. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Great, okay, well, we'll just take, uh, let's see. I got 11 o'clock on the dot on my phone, so we'll take a five minute break and regather.
Hi there, we're gonna get started here. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that the Q&A is enabled, so you're welcome to type any questions you may have in there and um, I can read them aloud to Lucretia. We'll take, we'll pause it as needed um, to answer questions um, or we may you know, answer them later if it's something that you want more information on. So take it away. Welcome back. That the, the break is just short enough to just run down the hall and come right back. Um, but that's good. It's a good use of time. So um, we talked about identities. We've, we've talked about a few things and I've thrown some words out there. So I wanted to share um, a few uh, definitions before we move forward, because you may hear me talk about some of it, or these words may be in your mind as we've been talking about social identities, psychosocialization, some of these words may be in your mind. Um, and I wanted to kind of put that out on the table. So when we talk about diversity, what we're simply saying is, these are the ways in which an individual is unique that include the multiple dimensions. Remember the corn fairy diversity dimensions that I shared, um, reflective of that person's identity. Um, lived experience is a personal knowledge or direct experience gained through firsthand involvement through choice and decisions. And I have the word and underline the effect of that experience on one's identity, whether it's uh, claimed or ascribed. So I have to stress the word and because all of us have lived experiences, obviously. Um, we um, you know, go through life and are experiencing it in ways that are unique to us. Um, but I'm specifically talking about in the way of social identity, when we talk about lived experience, it's that which is unique to that um, identity group, particularly one that has been marginalized. So that's what I'm talking about there. Intersectionality, when we look at the corn fairy diversity dimension, it's how all the identities, particularly those that are marginalized, come into play. So it is the complex and cumulative way in which the effect of multiple forms of discrimination, because we might discriminate based on different identities, combine, overlap, or intersect, especially, as I mentioned, the experience of marginalized groups. And oppression is a combination of prejudice and institutional power that creates a system that regularly and severely discriminates against some groups and benefits other groups. So at this point, we should be have this cycle of socialization should be kind of seared in our brain because when I talk about um, oppression and this system, I'm talking about a pattern, right? So a repeated pattern of the way in which we behave, react, respond, engage, perceive, and act upon our beliefs. All right, so when we talk about systems, because I mentioned that in the definition of oppression, when we talk about systems, what I'm talking about, what we're talking about are patterns, are structures that are um, constructed and reinforced over time. So in equity or inequality of uh, this, this diagram talks about inequality, we'll talk about that more, Inequity is essentially a result of systems that are imbalanced. And over time, we can see how multiple factors, I've talked about some of those already, reinforce patterns that ripple not on, only within a system, but across. So our institutions, the organizations that we are part of is a system. Healthcare is a system. The school system is a system right? Law enforcement is a system. So over time, we see how this imbalance is reinforced not only within those systems, but across other systems. So as we can see this conversation about bias and framing and socialization, we can see how these factors impact other areas of um, our engagement. So this diagram here is meant to point out um, how while socialization kind of embeds our individual biases and then the way we interact then embeds interpersonal power imbalances and therefore together work to 
build institutional policies and practices. And that was seen in um, some of the laws that were enacted and then structurally how that has played out over time globally, societally, that's, is that a word? I don't know, um, and different levels of impression. So I'll read my notes here because I started to talk to it, but I wanna be clear about my notes. So in individual biases, implicit, explicit, conscious, and unconscious bias uh, ways of thinking and messages are reinforced. And then we act on that internally. So intra, I have you know a sense of my identity, and what that might look like, look like, I might internalize that. And across people groups that shape norms and behaviors. Remember, we're not born um, thinking this, but over time, those messages are taught to us um, and then reinforced. And then they are then reinforced across institutions. And we do that oftentimes through our policies and our practices and across society as a whole. And we saw that in the laws that we enact. Um, so we can see that more in this next slide when we talk about uh, systemic oppression. My button's a little slow, so I want to be careful. Oops, I went right over it. Okay. So when we talk about systemic oppression, I'm talking about the outcome of bias, what's above the iceberg, right? So that behavior that is uh, visible, that we see and, uh, and or experience through our other senses. Um, and so this diagram kind of repeats what you saw on the other slide, but it's a way for us to think um, quite pointedly about um, how our biases or excuse me, our beliefs and actions continue to perpetuate oppression when you think about it that way. So the questions I would have you to ask yourself or to ask your groups, um, or to ask your, your teams, your leadership teams, or whatever uh, uh, groups you are working alongside of or participating in, what inequitable patterns of experience and outcomes are playing out in our system, right? So looking above the iceberg, what do you see? What are the patterns you see? And how do you know, again, I, I would encourage you to ask yourself how how is that experienced through the five senses? That's one way to think about it. But another way to think about how do you know is how do the artifacts in our environment reflect that, right? So food, dance, language, all the ways in which we engage as a culture, as a society, how are inequitable patterns of experience um, played out in our system? Again, um, I want to take us back to the very early part where I said we are widening our lens. We're looking back to look forward. Here's the part where we're looking out before we look in. So I think uh, a point to make here is that it's dangerous to put ourselves in the place of, well, I've not experienced that way. That's not really the point of this reflection. The point of this reflection is to think about other identity groups and what, pat what are their patterns of experience, particularly if they're inequitable and how is that played out? How do you know that? And then the next reflection point is what structures and system dynamics are contributing to these inequitable patterns? So again, it's thinking about, when we think about structures, what are the policies and practices at place that might, in play that might be um, contributing to this? Um, how is this, um, interacting and accumulating over and across institutions. Um, and again, I want us to think about patterns, patterns, patterns. These are happening repeatedly and then become reinforced. And definitely um, they are embedded um, in our society. So I wanna talk about, I've been talking about inequity, inequity, inequity. Let's talk about the difference between equality and equity. Um, I often hear uh, people use the word to mean the same thing, but equity is not the same as equality. Though they are often used interchangeably, equality and equity are different. Different, excuse me. Equality is, um, is the goal of equality, excuse me, is to make sure that everyone has access to the same things, right? 
So in this image, we see in the top part of equality, everybody has the same thing. Um, while that might sound good, we don't all start at the same place. Remember, social group identities. And so we all need something different to thrive. In this first image, you can see at the top, if everybody has the same bike, the obvious outcome in equitable patterns above the iceberg, the obvious outcome is everyone is not having the same experience. Some people can't even engage in the experience if we all have the same thing. Where equity differs is that it means that we all have what we need to thrive. Um, uh, we have access to what we need to thrive. And, and that's a very subtle but important distinction. Um, it does not assume that people should be treated the same. That's what all these bikes say. Everybody gets the same thing. What equity takes into consideration is a person's unique circumstance, and we adjust accordingly. The end result then is equal, okay? So in this lower diagram, we see equity means that different people at different um, points in their life or different abilities are able to engage in the act of bicycling, but using a different form of bike. Why is equity important? Equity is important because what I just shared, systems are out of balance because of repeated patterns over time. And so equity is a way of putting systems back into balance. Equity is not only um, a outcome, but it's also a process. This process here is considering that there are different folks with different needs, so we will give you what you need. And the outcome of it then is equal because I get to engage in the same way others get to engage. The other important point I'll bring out about equity is that equity benefits everybody. I bring this up often. Let's assume this person here is a younger person. It could be a short person, shorter person, um, but let's assume that they are a younger person. Equity works for everybody in the sense that this younger person could actually become this person and need a different type of bike or this person and need a different type of bike, right? We don't know life circumstances. But equity works for everybody in the sense that it says, um, I'm, I'm not looking to treat you equally. I'm looking to take into account and to consider that we all um, come at this from a different place um, and have unequal um, beginnings. So big message here that I want us to walk away with is that equity and equality are different. Equality means everyone is treated the same exact way, regardless of differences and regardless of the um, disadvantages that they may have experienced in their life, lived experience, if we remember that word, regardless of their lived experience. And equity means everyone is provided what they need to succeed. Considering again, lived experiences, the disadvantages that they um, were born into, cycle of socialization, remember that, the disadvantages they were born into and the um, systemic imbalances that are a part of the structures that we are a part of, again, have no fault in forming, but have a huge opportunity in um, shaping. So um, I wanna take us to a place where we're gonna actually close out on and talking about um, how we might move from ourselves to systems to think about how equity um, is important um, and can be a way to address the disadvantages that folks are experiencing by using an equity lens, okay? So I will first say, when I talk about self to systems, I'm talking about what we've talked about today, exploring our own identity and becoming aware of the advantages and disadvantages that I might be experiencing, going back to the identities worksheet, again, as a tool to think about how might this one identity create access for me and how might this other identity create a barrier. It's also a good way to flip it, look out and say, 
how might this person's identity create access for them and how might their identity create a barrier for them? Really important to talk about when we are thinking about our role as a um, committee or a council or a group that reflects the public and reflects multiple intersectional, I shared that word, identities, really important to look out and think that way because it will help us to then step back, look in and identify how we are perpetuating some of those norms and rules that either create access for some or barriers for others. So that's when I say self to systems, that's what I'm wanting us to think about is exploring identity, identity looking out at the people we serve and thinking about impact um, again, to think thoroughly then throughout our organizations, the ones that we serve on voluntarily and the ones that we are paid to participate in and how those organizations continue to reinforce messages, reinforce and reward um, the outcomes and the results. And then how is that then experienced across systems, healthcare, education, government, law enforcement, all of those systems that come into play. So we can address systemic barriers and inequities by becoming aware of the inequities that exist in the communities we serve. I talked about that when we look out. To be deliberately inclusive, we can do that. And we can do that first by starting with the Exploring Identities Worksheet. How might this particular identity um, be left out uh, because of whatever history is at play? Um, and we also address systemic barriers as a way to ensure full participation across intersecting identities. So I, I mentioned that word earlier. I um, give you the Exploring Identities tool and on the DEI page, there's an identities matrix that pulls out more identities as a way for us to be consciously aware. Because remember, we're socialized to kind of suppress that and be unconscious. Um, so consciously aware of all the identities that are um, at play and how might we engage them to fully participate. So it's really important to look here at self across the system, wish I had an arrow there to help us think about um, equity. So we do that um, by using an equity lens. It helps us to think about the areas of equity impacts because as I said, equity is a process and an outcome. So it helps us, the equity lens as a metaphor in itself, helps us to think about um, what processes do we have in play that ensure everyone has an opportunity to participate and therefore thrive and therefore have equal access. And equity is also an outcome in the sense that it's writing imbalanced systems. So when I talk about equity lens as a um, metaphor, I want us to think about it um, as a, kind of a way to prime us to look deeper. Remember the iceberg? So there's behavior we experience and we're seeing an equity lens says for us to stop and think more deeply about what's at the heart of it. We talked about bias, but there's a lot more at play. Um, we looked at history, but there's a lot more going on there. And then what is that connection to the disparate outcomes and experiences that's evident at the top of the iceberg? How do we do that? How do we um, utilize an equity lens? First, we're gonna look at who's in the room. We're gonna think about identity. Who's in the room when we're having a conversation and when we're meeting, who's invited? Um, we're gonna examine who's making decisions. Who holds all the power? Um, and remember, because we are a part of a, of a cycle that perpetuates across many generations, um, what is reinforced oftentimes is who gets to make the decisions and who holds the power. Um, identify who's getting left out of the conversation. So while we're sitting around the table with our committees, our groups, our organizations, whichever you're a part of, to start identifying who are the folks that are asked for their opinion and asked to be part of the decisions? This is how we take a simple approach to, um, to equity. 
Um, and then also focus on information gathering. Remember the framing effect um, and the decision making on those most impacted by those decisions. So the way in which I deliver the information, again, is going to impact how it's perceived by the person making the decision um, and then the people who are impacted by this decision. An equity lens then leads us to adopt an equity framework. So an equity lens is a place to start to reflect, to think, and to point out. But a framework is um, ideally a tool. It can be a, you know, a, a set of agreements that you make as part of your group to go through a set of questions, a simple set of questions in the beginning. It could be an understanding as part of your policy that prior to making a decision, you strive to answer these questions. It could be um, decision points or checklists that you use as your group to say, before we move to the next step of our decision, we ask ourselves a set of questions. And then we use that to frame conversation so that we're thinking deeply about impacts. We're thinking deeply about what's happening beneath the iceberg and how is that being surfaced above the iceberg. So um, an equity lens, as I said, leads us to an adopt an equity framework, which for us can be a simple set of questions, right? So who benefits most from this decision? If we think about the equality and equity diagram um, and the bicycles, who's having um, the best experience as a part of um, our decision to give everyone the same bike? Okay, so who might then have a better experience if we um, suggest or purchase or have different bikes available? Who is not included in this decision that we're making, the conversation, um, the information that we're gathering? Who's not included? Very simple set of question. And then what contributes to this exclusion? Is it because we don't know that they exist? Is it because um, we don't have a relationship with them? Is it because they don't have access to us? Um, our buildings are inaccessible, our meetings are inaccessible. Is it because they don't speak the language in which we deliver? Um, so those are, those are questions to ask when we think about what contributes to this exclusion. And then what can we do differently to ensure inclusion? So this is the shift, right? This is part of that decision point at the bottom part there where we said we can take action. That's the reframe. That's the change. That's part of the education. So more pointed questions I might ask myself at this point is um, as a committee, as an organization, who do we exist to serve? And are those people centered in our work? And then who's represented on the committees and commissions and so forth that we are part of? That's as simple as looking around, that's above the diagram, and then going, excuse me, the iceberg, and then going through that exploring identities as a group to say, are we really representing the people that we said we serve? Um, and then I asked again, who makes the decisions, not only within the committees and the commissions, but within the populations we serve? Are we then including people who have been entrusted um, to make those decisions and are those people that we have contact with to make the decisions really the people who make the decisions. Uh, you will be surprised the informal level of authority that's held in some communities. And then what's the status quo? Think cycle of socialization again. Where are we not enacting change and just kind of repeating the same patterns of behaving and thinking. Um, so why do we use an equity lens? Why do we care about an equity framework? I want us to think about it as a quality improvement tool. We improve the quality of our decisions when we have an equity framework. It's also a process for asking questions related to systems, to structures, um, to the processes and practices that we use. So it's, it's a more pointed way of saying all of the systems and the structures that we are a part of, they need to be unraveled, but we need to unravel them in a way that makes sense. And it's also a way to challenge our thinking. So I want us to remember 
that all of us, myself included, are born into a, a, a world where we are socialized to hold certain biases. And so it's a way to challenge that and then to also challenge what are our subsequent actions? I am doing this, why? Am I doing this because I believe it to be the right thing to do or because that's what I've always done? Yeah. So as I mentioned, the equity uh, lens or framework is a quality improvement tool. Um, we will talk about some of this more in, in a subsequent um, session, but I want us to think about how the equity lens can be a decision-making tool that prompts us to ask different um, questions and to consider multiple perspectives. So really quickly, we'll go through some of this. An equity lens helps us to surface some of our assumptions, right? Why am I making this decision? What information is this based on? It helps us to engage multiple perspectives. I hold one identity, I shared my identities matrix, and it impacts the way I see myself and what I'm aware of. Um, but there are other identities that I am not aware of that I probably um, know little about. And so I need to engage them so I get a better sense of um, how the policy decision or practice might impact other perspectives. Having an equity lens, putting on you know, those equity glasses and establishing a framework helps us to evaluate um, and in this diagram, it talks about raising racial awareness, but I will offer, it will also help us to raise awareness about other identities, which is what I've been talking about, social identity groups. Um, and becoming more aware because we're looking at above the iceberg. How do we know? What are we experiencing? What are other people experiencing? It then helps us to determine how we're gonna evaluate outcomes. Um, we can set and evaluate outcomes based on what we know are repeated patterns that are a result of imbalanced systems. We don't have to look far to see that. Um, we can think about even like accessibility in our buildings, our programs, and our services. We don't have to look far to see what does that look like for someone who has low visibility um, to participate in, in our meetings and to engage. What does that look like? Um, for someone who does not speak English or for someone who has very low trust, someone of color who has very low trust in a government entity, what, the, what might that look like? So we wanna talk about that. And more, more, more and more so, more importantly is communication. How are decisions communicated? How is information communicated? Remember the framing effect, really important for us to start there as a place of interrupting bias when we think about that cycle of socialization. And so our my final slide here is some ideas that I would share with you to take everything that I've talked about today um, and apply it um, to your day-to-day, -day, even as you get off this call and move, move about um, in the world to think about the the diagrams that I share, not only as tools for your groups, but tools for you. So we talked about history earlier on. Um, that might be a place for you to start, for your group to start, to research the history of legislation related to the particular area your advisory group serves. How has past legislation um, impacted the populations that you serve now? What are the outcomes? What's happening above the iceberg? That's a really good place to start. There are plenty of places to go online. I have a document that has a, a bunch of um, legislation links. I'm not sure that I've, I've shared that, but I can follow up with Rebecca later. So that's a place to start. Um, a second uh, place to put your I, the ideas we've heard today into action, I've mentioned this often, is to explore some of the ways in which your identity creates more or less access for you. I put opportunity there because I think that's a better word, a better way to frame what opportunities are made available to you because of your identity. I've already shared mine, right? Because of my education. Um, that's in my, um, excuse me, I shared English. So that's created a lot of opportunity for me. But I would also ask you to turn this around, turn it out, and to think about what are the ways in which your identity um, creates a barrier or disadvantage for other folks. 
right? So because I engage in the world fully in English, um, even though I have my parents in mind, it's very easily easy for me to not be conscious of the fact that while I engage in English and am comfortable in English, that for other folks, that's not their first language. And so therefore it creates um, barriers for them in the way of accessing, in this regard, government um, services. And then the last thing I will share is that I encourage you to take note of the ways in which inequity is experienced in the groups or organizations that you are part of or experienced um, in the um, population groups that you live alongside. So it's taking that iceberg image and um, making note of how the world is experienced through our five senses. What do we hear? What do we see? You know, all of those things and how an equity might be acting out there for um, individuals that you are aware of. Um, and that is, whew, I, I think I went through that faster than the last time. Um, that's the end of what I wanted to present. What I hope you leave away, leave with today is an idea of um, why equity is important and the part that you might have to play in that. The very first place I always ask people to start is in self-awareness. And so if it's easy for you to see a bias in others and not see it in yourself, to see an equity, to see equity in all the systems around you, then that may be a place to start more work because um, bias is present in all of us. Um, and equity is very real for uh, many social identity groups. Um, and in order for us to kind of uh, be aligned with that, to have a better understanding of that, we need to start with ourselves to be more aware of um, our experiences um, in life. And so that is it for me, Rebecca. Did you see any questions? I don't. Does anyone want to pop any questions into the Q&A? Um, I'll, I'll review a couple things. I just thank you, Lucretia. This is just fantastic foundational information. Um, reviewing these terms and these concepts, a lot of people may have heard of, but weren't really sure what they meant or how they might apply them. Um, I just want to remind you that um, a little survey will pop up as you leave this Zoom session, and we encourage you to fill it out. It's really brief, but it'll give us some feedback. And we encourage you, if you haven't already, to register for the next two classes. They're an hour each. They take place Thursday, October 26th. 5.30 to 6.30 and 7 to 8. And um, Lucretia will be taking these foundational terms and concepts and helping us learn how we can apply those to more equitable and inclusive engagement in our public discussions that we have, the discussions we have about uh, funding uh, recommendations, when we're looking at comp the comprehensive plan um, and providing input to the county, and when we're interacting with the public. and um, you know, serving as a conduit to commissioners and to county departments, to helping people get to the resources that they need um, to be successful in our communities. So thank you for being here. I did want to mention um, that the county has hired um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion manager. Uh, Kimberly Yolanda Williams will be joining the county the first week in November, and she will come uh, be coming on board um, not only to help us internally as staff um, work through being more uh, inclusive um, and equitable in our policies and procedures, but, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to partner with her and bring some additional training to our advisory groups. I'm going to be um, working with her to update the advisory group handbook and um, hopefully provide some more tools uh, to help our advisory groups and their communications with the public and internally within the group. So please, please do visit the website, kcowa.us forward slash advisory group DEI. And we will be adding resources to that um, as we go along. That'll be a, a, a page that will, um, you know, stay long after this initial training um, and in a place where you can turn to um, 
to, as especially when you're bringing on board new members or um, if you have a situation within an advisory group meeting that comes up and you feel like you need some guidance and tools, I hope that you'll refer to that website. Um, so yeah, I just want to thank everybody again. Lucretia, it's just so awesome to have you here. And I appreciate everyone that took time out of their Saturday morning to be with us. So thanks again for coming. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rebecca, for this opportunity. See you in a few weeks. Okay. All right. Bye. And please let people know this recording will be posted on the website as well um, next week. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have a great Saturday.